Good morning, Christ Church. It's good to see you all. Oh, you're so nice. So the, the down button is forward. Good morning, the Lord be with you. Good morning, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we are all a pilgrim people wandering on a journey. May you guide us as we take each step forward in our life. Help us to encounter many epiphanies along the journey, and may angels meet us in new places. May we have experiences that take away our breath and make us wonder. May you let us be vessels for your grace to those we meet. And may we realize that wherever we go, there is community to be found, and you are always watching over us and holding us in the hollow of your hand. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to begin by thanking you all for this wonderful sabbatical. It is such a gift to be able to have something like this. I see Dick Shell out there. Dick, did you get sabbaticals when you were the headmaster of the school? Zero! <laughs> I should never have reached out to you for an illustration. <laughs> but you, I'm sure you would have loved one. There's so much to be said by having a chance to step away from what you do. And, and I, it was a God, uh, honest truth, that when I got overseas and I looked in the mirror, I just thought, who is this ancient man? And by the time I got back, I did feel like a younger person. When you stop carrying all of that stress, all that worry, all that dialogue that goes in our heads today about, did I answer this email? Is this prepared? You know, and we carry people in our hearts all the time that we're worried about, praying for, trying to help. Um, suddenly to have a break like that. And I knew that I had a real break when I couldn't remember names anymore. And historical dates that used to come to me like that, especially from church history and all. And suddenly I drew this blank and I thought, either I'm developing dementia or I'm really on sabbatical. So before I say anything more, I just want to ask, are there any key questions you want to see me talk about or have me talk about today about sharing a little bit about the first uh, two-thirds of the sabbatical? Anything that comes to mind? That, yes? Europe and the Camino. Spain, okay. Okay? I was only there like a year ago. <laughs> Not a change. Uh, other, other questions? Okay, let me just share them. Um, when I left, I didn't have a lot of clear direction. It wasn't like, I'm going to write a book about Celtic spirituality and spend the whole time in Ireland. I am actually trying to write a book about Celtic spirituality now, thanks to having just um, prepared for and, and helped to lead our Celtic pilgrimage to Ireland recently, which was magnificent. You can talk to the 23 people who went, but it was, it was absolutely incredible. Instead, I, I knew I just wanted to spend time in Europe again, I wanted to do some more walking. I've now walked 10 different Caminos, and I wanted to work on my language skills. Um, I used to speak Italian semi-fluently, and then it kind of all evaporated when I focused for about a decade on trying to learn Spanish. I still need lots of work on my Spanish, and then I, and I found an incredible Spanish teacher, thanks to a forum we had. Many of you remember when Dr. Robert Waldinger, thank you so much. Everything goes better with a latte. Um, Dr. Robert Waldinger, who is a head of the Adult Human Development Study at Harvard, affectionately known as the Happiness Study. It's the world's longest running study of human happiness. Um, and he spoke to a packed room here, and afterwards we did a podcast. And at the end of the podcast, he mentioned, I said, you know, what are some of your hobbies and interests? He said, well, I, I like to study Spanish. He's lived down in South American things. And he said, I have this teacher from Spain. And immediately my ears perked up because it's the Spanish spoken in Spain and the Spanish culture that has just so fascinated me for about the past 10 or 12 years um, and making my first Camino there, etc. Uh, so that caught my attention. And so I asked him about, could I, you know, get the name of your teacher from you? He does it over Zoom. And so he, he gave me Javier's 
um, address and stuff in Spain and I uh, contacted him and he said be glad to teach me. It's the best um, bargain in the world. It's $25 a lesson for an hour of Spanish. And he's very rigorous. I mean, he's always coming down on me on various, you know, verb tenses, etc. Um, it does make it hard because, you know, you have to say it this way or use this preposition instead. But, but the chance to go further in another language is huge uh, and really exciting to me. So I wanted to work on my Spanish, work on my French, and then try to see if I could resurrect my Italian from the grave, a true resurrection act. Um, I was hoping to do some walking in each of these countries, and that was about it. The ancient Celts, they say, and you've got to take everything you hear about Celtic Christianity with a grain of salt because um, there's a lot of kind of myth and legend mixed up with the truth. And I have about 70 or 80 books on Celtic Christianity laying on tables in the rectory right now. And as I dig deeper and stuff, you find out there's a lot of um, kind of misinformation out there. For instance, they, the Celts built these incredible 100 foot on average towers. Uh, that they think may have been bell towers. They may have been symbolic markers like a steeple at a church that said, here's where Christ's church is located. This, in this case, here's where the monastery at Glendalough is located. There may have been bell ringers who rang a bell by hand at the very top. But a lot of times they say they were the places of last refuge for the Viking when the Vikings attacked. That the monks could scurry up these ladders, pull the ladders up in the bell tower, and be somewhat safe at least for about 20 minutes until a fire was lit around the tower and I... Uh, they were smoked out. But the fact is that the Viking raids took place in the 9th century, generally. And they were over, uh, by and large, by the time the spell towers started to appear in the, in the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th century. So always digging down, trying to find more information to... Uh, so I'm working on this book on Celtic Christianity now, but when the Celts took a pilgrimage, they generally, it said, and, and you know, I think it'll be interesting as I read more how true this is, they would go without a destination in mind. And that's so unlike any of us. I mean, who said, I'm, cr I'm going on a trip. Where? I don't know where. I'm going to get in the car on Tuesday morning and see where it takes me. But the Celts would do a little of that to see where the wind would take them in their sails, the wind being ruach in uh, Hebrew, pneuma in uh, Greek. The wind is also the same word for spirit. Where would the Holy Spirit guide them on this journey? Uh, so I wanted to do a bit of that, you know, just say, instead of saying I'm walking this specific thing, I want to just see how this stuff unfolds. So the one thing I had planned is I had two weeks with my Spanish professor. I was able to uh, live with his family. His, his father's uh, retired. His mother's a great cook. She taught me how to make paella, or what they call in Granada, un arroz, um, a rice, you know. But so every part of Spain has kind of its own arroz, and um, so I learned how to cook in the kitchen with her. Now I've got to actually do it on my own. But um, so I had a chance to go deeper in one community. And so I'll show some slides about that. But after that, it was going to be kind of freewheeling to see. First of all, I didn't even know which pilgrimage I was going to start out with. I had ordered a number of books on the trails and guides and places to go. I was actually feeling more drawn to go towards the sea on this level walk, but I got in touch with one of my dearest friends in Spain, who's the guy who first introduced me to Spain, who's a guide, if you're ever looking to bring a group of three or four or two of you over, he's the best person I know of all of Spain to arrange that. And he's based up in the north of Spain. And so Charlie Schwab, my friend, said, let's do the Camino Aragonés. Of course, instead of being calm and flat and by the sea, it was all in the mountains. So uh, much more of a workout than I was anticipating, but great experience. So I'll show slides about that in a second. And um, so it was about discerning both how to meet some kind of intellectual, spiritual, and athletic needs maybe um, on this and a chance to kind of rebuild. And while, you know, clergy are so blessed to have something like this, um, academics are so blessed to have something like this. One thing I will say for this is most weeks I work some, sometimes seven days a week. You do that for, you know, it was five and a half years um, waiting for a sabbatical. Normally it's supposed to be four, but it just because we were short on clergy. Uh, you take away one or two days of day off per week for five and a half years, and it takes its toll. Sometimes, you know, you have a month where you don't have a single day off. And I'm not trying to, like, 
pull out a violin here. What I'm, I'm trying to say is that it's really hard to turn that off switch, to stop worrying about someone in the hospital, stop worrying about someone's cancer, stop worrying about someone's parent who has Alzheimer, who's now lashing out at a son or daughter um, over issues that, you know, they can't control and see anymore steadily. And you, I realized that when we make our journey, our Camino in life, all this stuff is going on in our head. And so a, a time like this to actually s spend, when, whenever, when I was in any of these countries, all I did is read and study in that language and try to speak that. So to read things about the Spanish Civil War, which I find incredibly fascinating, especially in our country that's become way too divided. Um, we're all Americans, we're all in this together. Uh, to see what happened to a society where they lost it and they went against each other and it wasn't the North against the South, it was Greenwich split 50-50 coming after each other. And whoever in the overall region was in control, people would walk their neighbors out for a little walk, a paseo, and they wouldn't come back. Um, and I've seen people digging up the graves now, very carefully in, in operations orchestrated by the state, to find the bodies of the people buried outside of villages and cities. There are not enough teams, and there's not enough money to do this. So it's like winning the lottery when your town gets a professional team of forensic experts to come in and unearth to find out where your grandfather was actually buried. Um, so to me to see how a culture that was so developed could unravel, so religious could become so monstrous, um, I've read a lot about that and will continue to read about that. There's also the way religions lived in Spain is so different with the relics. I mean, it's kind of like bone worship. But when you and I, you know, knew COVID was around, everyone wanted to get, a, well, most people at least, wanted to get the shot, wanted to get the booster. All of us are thinking now, when should I get my next booster? Um, smart stuff to do. The idea of seeing a relic was like getting a booster. And it could be for you or it could be for your spouse who is very ill or your son who is crippled. By making this pilgrimage and getting to visit the relics of Santiago de Compostela, Thomas Beckett, you name it, it was like a spiritual force that came over you. And one of the amazing things that happened to me on this pilgrimage was I was gobsmacked to be in some places to find out one of the great saints or theologians was buried right in that place where I was. I was in a convent in Toulouse, France, um, only to discover that in this wonderful space under the altar was St. Thomas Aquinas, who's considered one of the three doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, who anyone who goes to seminary reads his scholastic theology, which was a synthesis of the work of Aristotle and great Christian thinkers, thanks to Avicenna and Averroes, two of these incredible Arab scholars living in Cordoba, which I had a chance to visit, who translated the lost works of Aristotle. The Europeans had lost all of Aristotle's works, but the Arabs had them in Arabic. So they translated this work into Latin, which meant that scholars like Thomas Aquinas in Paris could use it and suddenly unleash this new theology that brought to us you know, the, the doctrine at that time of the transubstantiation which is a different from our own theology. We believe in the doctrine of real presence. But stumbling upon his grave like that, I was at a hotel in Rome, and I um, found out about this church nearby that was really worth seeing. I went there, and I found out that, that Catherine of Siena, who I had studied on another sabbatical, and uh, I, when I was in Siena, if you've ever been in Siena to go to San Domenico, you will find there this incredible church, and inside the church... I, was, I got to know the rector there as a lovely guy, an Italian poet, and I asked him in his office, so where, by the way, is St. Catherine buried? He said, you do not know? I said, no, I do not know. Uh, he said, come with me. So we exit his office, we go down the side of the church in what they call the nave, and in a glass display case, he said, there. And I see this shrunken head. I mean, an absolute shrunken head and a finger, her right index finger. And I was like, okay, now I know. <laughs> But, but when I'm in Rome, I found out that the rest of her, you know, minus the finger and the head, are under the altar, and I'll show you pictures of that next week. 
But to go, you can go into that kind of tomb right by the altar and place a prayer request right on a statue of her body lying there. It's just amazing. Uh, so I came across these saints like that, uh, San Domenico, I'll show pictures of that next week, St. Dominic, who founded the Dominican Order, St. Francis of Assisi, whose tomb I'd been to before. So I had these moments where I was literally gobsmacked. So let me just start to walk you through some of um, what this looked like. This is my backpack. I was, you know, selecting it, REI. How stupid. I, I thought, like, I, I got a backpack that was one, like, pound less weighty, but I knew I'd had to carry it for uh, three months and just wanted to make sure I didn't have any gear that started to fall apart. I don't recommend living out of one of these for three months. Uh, but if there was a miracle on my, you know, experience, it was um, doing this. And uh, so I had a wonderful moment with the Archbishop of, of Jerusalem. I kind of delayed my sabbatical so we could host him here. And they're going through so much. You know, our, my heart goes out to all of our Jewish brothers and sisters around the world, and especially in Israel, as they come up on the commemoration of the, that ghastly attack led by Hamas on, on the Jewish brothers and sisters who are completely innocent. And now the incredible, I think, overreaction by killing 40,000 people. Uh, 39 children died in the original attack. Over 10,000 children have died in the kind of countermeasures. Um, no sides really on the high moral ground here. I'm, and it's such a convoluted situation, very hard to, to kind of see where this will go. But anyway, I received a blessing by the Archbishop, and pilgrims would always do something like that before they set out on a journey. This is my Spanish teacher, Javi, who is half my age. Um, introduced me to playing Padel. Padel is you know, kind of starting to uh, uh, cross America now. It's a very cool sport. You can pick it up in about um, five minutes. I mean, it's not like tennis. You know, I need, I need a lot of ground strokes on this. It was a blast to play. And this is uh, Javi's father, Joaquin and he's playing a, a 12-string lute, um, an older instrument, and uh, he's retired and loves to talk about the Spanish Civil War. So I could just sit there and, and talk, and he lent me a bunch of books to read that um, I tried to order some copies. This, does anyone have an idea what this is? No. This is the kind of stuff you have to be kind of embedded in a culture to learn about generally. This is the uh, Cascamora. So there's a tradition going back for centuries that they discovered an ancient relic in Baza. Uh, that's the town I was living in. It's a pueblo of 21,000 people. It once had 50,000 people. It was more important than Granada, Spain in its day, in its height. It's a Roman um, town that goes back 2,500 years to the year 500 BC. And a relic was discovered there by um, archaeologists from Guadix, the next rival city or town nearby, and they wanted to take it back to Guadix. But the people of Baza said, over our dead bodies. So they kept this relic, and every year, the city of Guadix sends one runner and some kind of chaperone guards to try to retrieve the relic. Meanwhile, the people of Baza put oil on their bodies and then put this kind of like black paint uh, the oil is so that it can wash off. So, um, and the whole thing's not really politically correct or anything. But they go running to try to prevent this one runner to get the relic and bring it back. And of course, the runner never succeeds. But it's this primitive, ancient thing that goes on. And uh, it was really, well, it just took place a couple weeks ago on the annual day. This is a picture of Guadix, um, one of the, the most beautiful plaza area in the city that's neighboring. This, um, I just love situations like this. So I heard from Hadith's family, and one of the nice things, if you start to speak a language, you can ask questions, and I used to be a journalist and a reporter, so I was just kind of inveterate curiosity all the time. I heard from Hadith's father that there's a town right next to Batha with a um, hundred people. And I just like, what's it like to live in a place of 100 people. What was it like to go through the Spanish Civil War there and all sorts of other things? Um, so Javi took me there, and uh, Javi had been there a number of times, but we met the oldest gentleman living in uh, ba uh, Baul, which is the town, 
His name is Dionysius. He's 92 years old. So I talked to him, what was it like to be a child here during the Spanish Civil War? Now, this is the church in Baul, but what I should have put, there's a nondescript building right next to it, which is the Tele Club. It was the only place in the whole town that had a television. So, so instead of going to the movie theater, you go to the Tele Club to watch like Spanish news and some you know, entertaining movie. And it just gives you an idea of what rural life is in different parts of the world or in different parts of America, where you'd have one building that had the only television in town. This is gore. This is, um, I should have had another shot. Maybe I did, but it didn't get in. But this is taken from the top of the bullfighting stadium. So they have this miniature bullfighting stadium that's not much bigger than this room uh, with these kind of ramped up vertical seats. It's the cutest little thing. It's like a, a uh, honey, I shrunk the bullfighting stadium type thing. And I'm up there with a glass of wine because it's a wine tasting festival in a place called Gore, G-O-R. And again, this is like, there are almost no tourists there. You know, and so you're just going into the Spanish life. Here I am. I'm not actually the biggest wine aficionado. I'll tell you, that was a great glass of wine. <laughs> and this is the kind of typical comida we'd eat. You know, it'd be these deep fried sardines, um, some sausage, uh, pimientos, peppers, and, and a roaf. And that's outside of uh, Granada and the hill overlooking from Sacramonte. Sacramonte is where the gypsies section is. And this is up above where there's this wonderful monastery that I had visited, but it had been closed, and I couldn't go in before. This time I had a chance to go in. And so down in the caves, I experienced um, seeing this relic um, and the burial place of a saint called uh, um, St. Cecilius, who is um, St. Cecilius of Elvira, of all things, um, who is a first century saint, who is the paternal saint said to have helped to bring Christianity here to Granada for the first time, buried in this site. And on the first weekend of February every year, um, thousands of people in Granada come up by candlelight and fires that light the way through Sacramonte up the steep incline to gather in prayer and to be blessed in this special place. Now this is something, you know, again, you wouldn't do this as a tourist, but this is my Spanish teacher on the left, his sister-in-law in the middle and his brother across the way, we were playing board games and watching the Europa Cup um, up above. And I think one of the things, if I evangelized him, I helped him to develop a deeper love of, of soccer. Well, you know, he says, it was so much fun to watch all these games. But the, the Spaniards go out to a club like this, and some will have drinks, others just have a coffee or something, and they play board games. They're a hugely social people. Um, they're a hugely healthy social people. We need more opportunities just to be together socially. The Europeans have us beat in terms of the importance of a meal, being together, having dinner together every night, staying with extended family, not going off to live in all sorts of remote corners and say, well, I haven't seen my brother in over a year. You know, they hunker down in society. This just gives you an idea of just the, that was taken with like a, what, a .5 lens or something on my camera, but the construction of these cathedrals and churches is mind-boggling. I've never seen anything like it, not even in Italy. And in the cathedral here in, um, in Granada, in a side chapel, uh, uh, Ferdinand and Isabel, the, uh, what they call Los Reyes Católicos, the Catholic kings or rulers, are buried in tombs. You're not supposed to take a photograph in there. Um, I always take illicit photographs, <laughs> but it didn't make it to the slideshow. But, um, you know, to see the people who commissioned, it was really Isabel, she was the leader, he married and was more like a vice president going along. Um, she was of Castile, the larger uh, um, kingdom at the time, he was of Aragon. And anyway, they're buried right in there when Grenada, they helped to organize the final takeover of Granada, which was conquered in uh, 1492, the Muslims were sent packing along with our Jewish brothers and sisters living there. Um, it's both a, a moment of victory, a moment of, of dark times by expelling people. Um, and the Inquisition began after that to try to see anyone who wasn't truly uh, adopting Christian practices but was faking it. That's where it came from. This is the house of the great poet uh, Frederico Gar uh, uh, Garcia Lorca, 
who was killed during the Spanish Civil War at the outbreak. He was gay. You could not be gay. Um, once the war broke out, Franco, who was a very kind of effeminate man with a very weak handshake and very high voice, not exactly your model of you know the macho man, but he was the general. And you could not be gay. You could not speak another language except Castellan. You couldn't speak um, Catalan. You couldn't speak Gallego, the language of Galicia. You couldn't speak uh, Bobi, Bobli, the language of Asturias, or Valencia, uh, Valenciana, from Valencia. You could only speak Castilian. And you couldn't be of any other religion. And you couldn't be a Protestant. Um, so a number of Episcopal or Anglican priests were killed during the Spanish Civil War. Federico García Lorca was escorted out of town and gunned down until this day, they're trying to find his grave. So I had a chance to go in and explore his home on a guided visit. The churches were over the top in their decoration. Phenomenal. And of course, in a, this is called a retablo. They're just incredible. And then the relics. So to see these skulls and femurs and various bones, um, it's not quite what we do in the Episcopal Church, but it is. It, the Alhambra, of course. Any word, by the way, that begins with A-L is an uh, Arabic word. Uh, this is El Basin, which is the Arab quarter of Granada. The Alhambra at night. Now this is uh, Yehen, one of the Pueblos Blancos. The main Pueblos Blancos are in the Sierra Nevada, but you know it's so hot there that they have to paint the houses white to keep pictures down. And so I had started reading a book called South to Granada uh, by uh, an, an author um, who I've just become enamored with named Gerard Brennan. He fought in the First World War. At the end of the war, he received all of his pay for fighting. He was British. And he heard that Spain was the least expensive country in Europe to live, so he went there. And there's a wonderful film showing, and he shows up while a wedding's taking place. And he just comes up over the hillside, and he passes out from lack of water and food. Well, he, he settled in this town, and he lived there for seven years after World War I. And he writes about it in this book, South to Granada. Um, and so I was reading that in Spanish to work on my Spanish, and then I've ordered a bunch of his other books, and I'm reading his memoirs now. Um, and so he lived in this village, and I thought, what would it be like to be in this village of 200 houses, where there are three distinct social classes, where they still practice some sorcery back in that day that kind of had women who were known to be kind of have magical powers, um, where the curate had um, mistresses, which pleased the men because they thought my wife and my daughters will be safer because he has a mistress. Unbelievable, you can't make this stuff up. Um, and he lived there, and he began to become a writer, and he invited some... Uh, famous writers from the Bloomsbury group who were friends of his to come and visit him. Virginia Woolf, for instance, came and stayed. and uh, So he became a well-known Hispanicist. This is where he lived in... Uh, and this is a photograph of the time set back then that he was living there. Here I am in his former house with this woman who runs a, a little inn next door and let uh, Javi and me in to explore the former house and all these paintings, or pictures, you know, taking us back like a century. Those are just rooms that are kept intact. For me to go back and see what was it like 100 years ago in Spain or 400 years ago, I just find it riveting. Have any of you been to the Eric Sloan Museum? It's in, um, it's in Kent. I was just there last week with my younger brother, and it has all sorts of tools that this man who's an artist and an author and a, uh, and a sculptor uh, collected from early American tools and things. It's like exploring that and seeing what was our life like 150 years ago. That's Gerard Brennan. So it gives you a little side of the countryside. We were in the El Pujaras, which is a pretty remote region. It's not where most people go when they go to Spain. It is definitely off the beaten track. Ran into this castle, which was um, amazing. There we go. That's Our Lady of Baffa. This was only discovered in 1987. It is one of the, now the most, one of the most famous statues in Spain. It's kept in the National Museum of Archaeology in Madrid. And its sister 
statue is Our Lady of Elche, which was discovered long ago and is more famous. Here I am with the local priest, got a chance to chat with him about things. Here I am having a, a beer with my teacher in a, in a cave. This is a cave that's been converted into a hotel for with 32 rooms, a bar, and a restaurant. That's a picture of the outside and the kind of interesting chimneys they have. It's built into this hillside. And here you see caves where people live in the outskirts of Bafa to this day, especially gypsy families. They live into homes carved right out of the rock. So I'd read about things like this in the book, and then suddenly you see them, and it's just mind-boggling. This is a, um, an Arab bath in Bafa. It's underground. You, it's, you have to go down through like some metal stairs into this, beautifully kept intact from about the, uh, the 13th to 14th century. This is the arroz we learned to cook. And so we went up to visit some of the sites in between Baja and Granada of the Spanish Civil War where the troops camped out and built trenches that you can still visit to this day. But it's just like walking in history. No one's up here. It's very remote. There's Javi with the mountains behind him. So now I'm taking you to Cordoba. This is a work by Julio Romero de Torres, who's one of my favorite Spanish artists. Um, his father was an artist. His brother became an artist. He became the most famous of the artists. He's a symbolist of the Spanish tradition. If you look in the paintings, there's always like, there are men and women who are, like, you're wondering, she's like behind the tomb. Is she trying to hide from, and who is this gentleman with a cape and this figure heading off on a horse um, so there's all sorts of symbolism going on, and the faces. I'm told that the most beautiful women in all of Spain are in Cordoba. They have a very different look to them. Um, and anyway, he captures these people in an incredible way, and he began his career uh, by painting posters for um, um, bullfighters and attracting people to go to the bullfights, and then became one of the most famous artists in Spain. This, of course, many of you have seen this and been to it, is the mosque. In Spanish, the word is mesquita, and um, this is the mosque that was built by the uh, uh, Moors when they came and settled Granada. I think it dates back to 729. They conquered all of Spain in the year 711 and remained for 700 plus years in Spain. Spain was under Moorish rule, Islamic rule, for s over seven centuries. But shortly after the Reconquista, uh, which took place in Cordoba, 250 years before Granada, which is not far away, was liberated, the Christians turned it into a cathedral. So inside this enormous mosque, you have a cathedral built inside. It's a, and the, instead of the minaret, it has now become a bell tower. It's a, a, one of the great architectural gems of the world. This is at night. Now, the last part of my Spanish trip was to uh, do some hiking. So that's my friend Charlie Schwab. We went at the Somme port. It's just a, a pass between um, France and the northeast uh, corner of Spain in the Pyrenees. There's nothing up there. There's a restaurant. It's closed. There's a, there's a, a toll station. It was closed. Uh, so we had to actually hike up to it uh, because we couldn't get any ride up there. So then we had to hike down. And one of the cool things is we came upon this hospice. This dates to the 11th century. It turns out it's one of the three most important hospices in the known world back then. The other being in Jerusalem and um, one being uh, in Santiago de Compostela. So this is, or excuse me, one being in the uh, great St. Bernard Pass in Switzerland for those who made the pilgrimage from uh, Canterbury Cathedral all the way across France through Switzerland down in Italy to Rome. So anyway, you know, you just see this ruin which was only excavated by the Spanish government in 1987 and put back in shape so you get a sense of what it was like. These are things that you just, you know, just no tourist goes to because it's so remote. Um, this is at a uh, pilgrim's hostel where we stayed. This is like the best pilgrim's hospital, hospitals place I ever stayed, they had like drawers for every pilgrim and you could lock it so you could put anything in there and, and not worry about uh, getting it. Just you see the beauty, the, an old Roman bridge that they've kept intact. 
Now, Charles see, saw things, and this is a great thing when you walk with someone else. He saw things that I didn't stop to notice, like these incredible little stunning orchids, which you have to get down on the ground to, and take a magnified shot to see the beauty. But it's like so much in life, we're moving through so quickly that we don't see what's right before our eyes. This is the chapel in the cathedral in Jaca, um, which is like a capital of the Huesca region of Spain up in Aragon. And that's a detail of that in that chapel. This is, they have an incredible collection of um, Romanesque works from churches all across uh, the north of Spain. Now this, does anyone recognize this young man? William Bates. Okay, so he grew up here. He was a chorister. His parents, John and Abby, um, now live in Nantucket, or uh, Martha's Vineyard, Martha's Vineyard. But um, I knew his brother and he lived in this area, so I reached out, and William lives in Huesca, I mean in uh, Haka, so we were able to meet. We uh, met right in from some site in uh, Haka. This is his newborn daughter, and then he took me grocery shopping at a uh, co-op that he belongs to, and this is the view from his home. So he's not making a killing, you know, in the financial world, but he has this to look out every day, and he's working with Bill McGibbon, who was a speaker here before, working with 360. It's a major effort to deal with climate change around our globe, and so he's dedicated his life to trying to ensure that our children and grandchildren will have a sustainable planet to inherit. And so I got a chance to eat. He made the soup. I helped him make it. I was just like his little helper there, and it was unbelievably good. Uh, and that's his family there, his wife and his uh, two daughters. Now this is a festival, I, I, they got the wrong slide in here because there, were, there was another slide just before it. There, this is a, a, a festival that goes back to the 8th century when the people overthrew the Saracens, uh, Muslims, who had taken over Hakka. And what led to the victory is the women got, gathered together and took utensils from their kitchen and went out to defend their men. <laughs> so I, I like that, warrior women. And the, the Saracens thought these were reinforcements, so they went fleeing for the hills, and the city was liberated. So they celebrate that um, every year, and I happened to be there the day after, so I was able to go back to Hakka, kind of backtrack. And they had four cavalry members come in with poles with fake heads of uh, Muslims that they ride in. And so, um, you know, it was totally politically incorrect, and, and the the people I was staying with thought, no, they probably don't do that anymore. Well, they still do it. Yeah. Great outfits. The whole city, you know, like about a thousand people take part in costumes, including mothers and daughters and, and sons and stuff. It was so festive and joyful. This is the fortress which the French took over when they invaded in 810. This is the uh, head of the Alberg where I was staying. And just some more walking from there. That's one of the little mountain towns. The, the, the tough thing is, at the end of every hike, you have to go uphill. You know, you're just totally gassed. You're carrying this weight that feels like the weight of the world. I stayed in this village overnight. 16 people live here. Other people have like a second home and drive down from other parts to stay for the weekend. But it's like a ghost town. And this is, I had this whole room all to myself. Choose a bunk. Um, here's what I had. So there was like one restaurant, it's only open for like an hour, an hour and a half at night. Got over there, got a pasta carbonara. There's my South to Granada book that I'm reading. These are how you find your landmarks, the signs, the yellow fleshed arrow. It's an old monastery that I passed on the day's walk. Gives you an idea of how breathtaking the landscape is. This is an area where they, so if you talked about a gobsmacked moment, I heard that on a variant of the trail that I just walked, um, you know, there were these two incredible monasteries dating back to the 11th and 12th century. If you didn't read Spanish and speak Spanish and, you know, didn't hear about this, you'd lose it. But I thought, I will go back. When you say, like, ancient monastery, I'm like a dog wagging his tail. So I hiked back, you know, um, 12 and a half kilometers, but then I got on this road. So it's maybe 15 kilometers to get back to this thing. And they have these very unusual chimneys incredible Romanesque, you can see the round arch, and these figures going back to like the 11th, 12th century, they're spectacular. The structure is magnificent. 
there's where I ate with that guy looking down at me. And then I got to this monastery. Now, that, that shot's kind of cropped there. It's, it's built right into the cliff. It's called San Juan de la Pena, St. John of Sorrow. And it turns out it's one of the most important monasteries, in, if not probably the most important, in all of Aragon. The kings of Aragon were buried there. So this is like going to you know, Lincoln's tomb and Was seeing Washington and Ben Franklin, all those people buried in the same place. And it's just built right into the cliff. And then legend has it that this is where the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with, was kept for safekeeping when the Muslims invaded. And there's like a replica of what they said it, it looked like. I kind of have to think our Lord didn't have something encrusted with jewels, but, but that's just my own belief. So I walk out the door of this remote monastery, I hear all this clapping, and I wonder what's going on, because like, there's no one around. And there's a little group gathered to watch the Vuelta de España, the, like the Spanish Tour de France for women, racing by. And I could show you videos of it, but I had to walk up to this newer monastery, which is from the 12th century. And as I go up this narrow road, parts of the peloton are just passing me like two feet away. It was breathtaking. This gentleman, when you talk about angels you met along the way, was blind and walking the Camino with this gentleman helping him find his way. And this guy was going to the festival in Hakka, and the, the men actually dressed like that. No wonder the women have to defend them. <laughs> See if I didn't. So it gives you, this is from Seguenza, an incredible town with, inc I love those stone carvings. This is um, Dos de, uh, del Sol, this is where Ferdinand, the king of Aragon, was born. His mother was pregnant. She was about 10 miles away, and she knew she was going to give it birth, and she had to be rushed to um, Solstere, is the name, Solstere, um, in order for him to be born in Aragon, because he couldn't inherit the throne if he was born outside of the kingdom. It was literally written in their law. And so it's considered one of the most beautiful towns in all of Spain, uh, but off the beaten track. This is called La Fosse de Lumbier, uh, um, and it is this gorge with the cliffs going up over 100 feet on both sides, and it's magnificent, one of the best bird watching sites in all of Spain. And there are griffin vultures with wingspans exceeding nine feet. And I just sat there and took videos and pictures. It was breathtaking. So here I am towards the end of this Camino. This was an octagonal church, by the way, that's very rare. This is the bridge at Puente La Reina, um, which is a very important um, Romanesque bridge. And it's where the three Caminos coming down from France join into one. And from there out, the journey in Spain is known as the Camino Frances, the French Camino, because that's where all the French came together. And so I, one slide that didn't get in here is of a gentleman I met that night in the Elberg. And it turns out he's an American from Texas who is walking the Camino because he met an Episcopal priest in his hometown who talked about the importance of taking this spiritual journey. And his wife had died, and he was devastated. And so he brought her ashes, just like in the movie The Way, to scatter her ashes as they walked. And he said, she said to me when she was dying, Take me to places I've never been before. So I, I had a prayer and said a blessing upon him. Um, I'm sorry that slide didn't make it. I'll try to put it in for next week. This is a young woman I met just in walking to the bridge before I left to head on to France. And it turns out she's in Ireland studying to be a pastoral a chaplain in hospitals. But she confessed she was going through a faith crisis. Um, and so I just talked to her about how do you kind of rebuild your faith when you know you're struggling and, and how can you carry on and carry for people when you're struggling with your own faith um, so there are just you and I have opportunities like this all the time if we just slow down enough and ask a few questions and let people tell their story this is a Frenchman who helped me kind of guide to get on my way to France here I am in Rennes a city of 730,000 people 66,000 students 
and incredible timbered buildings. France was my favorite part of the whole journey. I loved it. I love speaking French. I, I, I speak it better than Spanish and Italian, and I just, I soaked this up. They had an incredible garden with roses named after all sorts of famous poets and singers and writers. Um, spectacular place. And then I couldn't resist this. Wall Street English. I thought if I need a second job after spending enough years in Greenwich, I might be able to go to Wren and teach Wall Street English. I began my Camino here, walking the GR23, which goes from Mont Saint-Michel, which the, the folks in Brittany and the folks in Normandy each claim um, is in, in, in their side of France. But I started from here. This dates back to 1710. It's a Benedictine abbey built on top of a feudal town. They still have a, a worshiping community that meets there now from Paris, from the community of Saint-Gervais. And these are horses riding at low tide. This is the cloister up in the abbey up above. I was able to worship there. If you ever want to visit, try to stay overnight. It becomes a ghost town. During the day, it's an unbelievable mob scene. So I set out from there, and I walked across pretty flat stretches of Brittany, passing some of the most incredible thatched houses I've ever seen. This is a tool used to build ancient cathedrals. They had windmills. This is a dog that was sitting at the bar. You walk in the bar, that's the only place you can get coffee in the morning, and meet a, a bartender who's canine. Uh, and this gentleman um, offered to buy me a coffee, and I reciprocated because he was buying a having a drink, so I bought him a second drink. Um, he's an oyster grower. They had the largest oyster beds in Europe right there in that town. The coastline was spectacular, very rugged, up and down, hiking. Uh, here I'm having... Uh, uh, sunset dinner in a place called La Colombe, and, and this B&B &B where I was staying was giving me the wrong coordinates on GPS. I spent half an hour after I was completely exhausted trying to find it, but it was a grace it came together. This was a sculpture of a man who was a priest who, when he was um, about my age or younger, had a, a cerebral uh, hemorrhage, and he became mute and deaf. And he dedicated the last 30 years of his life to carving figures in the stone right at this place that is now a rock garden. These are battlements, part of the Atlantic Wall. I'll show more pictures of that later. But to find these bunkers from World War II is amazing. This is Dinar, and that's San Malo. San Malo, 80% of it was bombed during World War II, completely rebuilt. Dinar is one of the swishest places on the coast of Brittany to stay. Uh, battlements. This is with, I, I had a chance to spend a long weekend with our daughter Marguerite in uh, Germany. And so we went to Regensburg, which I, it's voted the most livable city in all of Germany. It is a sensational. If you go to Germany, visit Regensburg. It is so worthwhile. This is Marguerite who teaches, um, and she runs the design lab at the Munich International School. So we biked over to visit and she showed me around. I was so proud of her. And these are Roman ruins basically back in back of the house where she lives in Starnberg. This is the bridge in Regensburg. This, they have the oldest chorister program in the world in Regensburg, and we happen to have a chance to hear them sing. This is a sausage uh, and sauerkraut meal in the oldest restaurant they claim in the world. It's 800 years old. And this is the Fougere, which is where Jacob Fougere who is a German, left the bequest. And if any of you are thinking of doing something to leave an enduring value, 500 years after he's left this, it continues to provide housing that's safe and secure for 150 people who couldn't afford it. The rule is you have to have become a Catholic at least two years before you apply. So it's a Catholic community. You have to say three prayers a day. One Our Father, one uh, Hail Mary, and one Confession of the Faith. That's it. And your, your, your rent is um, 0 0.088 euros a year. <laughs> so, uh, and now it's, it's regardless of gender um, or origin in terms of housing. 500 years of providing safe, secure housing. 80% of this was destroyed in the bombing in World War II. It was completely rebuilt. Still functions just as it is functioned. That's the chapel. This is in Augsburg, where the Augsburg Confession was signed. Very important Protestant document. This is a hotel room I stayed in 
Paris. I think it was the Hotel Estelle. Estelle. It, it cost under 100 euros a night to be in this 16th century timbered building. That's my daughter, Isabel, looking out the window. And this is my good friend, um, Cecile, who I've known since I was studying uh, French when I was uh, 21 or 22 living in Paris. This is the Louis Vuitton um, Foundation. I saw tons of art. I went to all sorts of exhibitions. This is the Cafe des Soubliettes, once a former dungeon and torture chamber, now turned into a, a jazz club, and I took our daughters out there. This is the Place des Vosges, taken from the window where um, Victor Hugo lived, and I toured his museum. He's my favorite author. Uh, Les Miserables is my all-time favorite book. It's the best Christian book, I think, out there. And this is the museum and the home of Auguste Rodin in Moudon. Um, that looks almost identical to the Philadelphia um, Museum of Rodin. And if you love Rodin, he's my favorite artist, this is like Mecca to go see. These are our daughters. They joined me in Paris. We had the best time. Isabel had come to attend a, Isabel's with the sunglasses over here, come to attend a wedding in Versailles. We all got together in Paris. And they took me to places like this rooftop cafe that I would never have found on my own. We had the best time. And then they took me to the arcades. I'd never, I spent a lot of time in Paris, never really visited the arcades. And then I went down to Toulouse, um, the La Ville Rose, because the stones are made of pink stone brick, and it's incredible at sunset. This is Carcassonne. Have any of you been to Carcassonne? It is the most intact walled city in all of Europe. It's where the Qatar lived. The Qatar are, was a, a, and the Albigensians were a, a, a derivation of the Catholic faith but they were viewed to be heretical, and they were, Richelieu came down on them. They were very painful, you know, they were burnt alive um, at the bottom of Montségur and things like that, but uh, it allowed me to explore more about what their original faith was, and they're now, theologians are saying they weren't that off track. They were just persecuted, uh, sometimes for all the wrong reasons. This is saint Severin. This is from my hotel room. I was able to get a window overlooking this. Incredible. This is Rouen, and so I'm just going to end with a little bit of Normandy. That's the famous cathedral that um, Monet painted on 23 different occasions. There you go, one of the paintings he did of it. It has the famous butter tower that was built by, during Lent, people contributed by not eating butter for the season of Lent. Um, the money they saved was spent to build one of the towers. This is Bayeux. Of all the places I visited, it was maybe, it was probably my favorite. And it was so American friendly. They were celebrating the 80th anniversary of D-Day. So it wasn't like really religious in one sense, and yet it was all about sacrifice. And that is at the heart of religion. Our Lord sacrificed his life that we might have eternal life. And the men and women who fought and died there sacrificed their lives. Americans above all on Omaha Beach, which is known as Bloody Omaha, 4,600 Americans killed on the first day of assault. Sherman tank from out front. They are so grateful to what Americans, British, and Canadians did that you couldn't find a France for an American. This is probably the last anniversary where any veterans will be there. So I had a chance to, to see some of the veterans who fought on that day. They had hundreds of people dressed up as reenactors. They came from all over Europe and the United States. You see a jeep load of guys looking like GIs right out of um, saving Private Ryan, and they'd stop and they'd speak Italian. <laughs> this is the cathedral where King Charles came and they had a service the day, be um, the day before on, on, a, on June 5th. I was there for that. This is a woman up front. I, I hit the record button for a video and I thought it went, it didn't work. She came, they waited for me, and then they went right by. Music's blaring from, you know, um, swing band music and there's a jeep full of other reenactors behind. They had singers come over from the United States and uh, saying, this is the German high command headquarters. I came upon this while riding an electric bike on a side road, and I saw this plaque. I stopped and found out this is where the generals were stationed to try to prevent any D-Day attack from succeeding. The bunkers you can walk around. I'm going to be giving a talk for the men in October about more information about the whole bunker experience and the D-Day invasion. Here I am with one of the survivors. And 
walking through the cemetery, there is a sense of holiness and sacredness that is mind-boggling. You see a plane flying overhead. That's a scene from Bayeux. And this is the last slide. I went to about six or seven museums. I learned a phenomenal amount about the invasion. And, and this is the most important museum, um, Le Memorial in Caen. And it really helps you understand. It doesn't glorify war in any shape or form. It helps you take a deep dive into what happened throughout World War II. And it has a whole section now on the Cold War. And then this is one of the reactors who, reenactors who did a parachute jump uh, that day. Um, and here he is in Caen. Uh, he just had dinner with a bunch of friends dressed like that. It was like just going on to a movie set. Thanks for your patience. I'm sorry we ran over. Next week I'll um, talk a bit about Italy. And I am asked by Bobby, who does so much here and makes sure everything we do succeeds wonderfully. Thank you, Bobby, for that. You're phenomenal. You can take one of the arrangements home with you to your home, so please do. And uh, make your home more beautiful. Those are from yesterday's uh, Friday night's party. God bless you.